what's the frame rate of the human eye? Spoiler alert, there is none. But there is, kind of. It's weird. Movies, video games, television, your computer, and your lights? All of these trick the human eye into believing that something that is only there intermittently is actually continuous. For most modern movies, 24 unique frames are flashed before the eyes between 48 and 72 times per second in order to give the illusion of continuous movement. For televisions, that number is 24, 25, 30, 50, or 60 unique frames, depending on how the program was captured and where in the world you're watching it. Computer screens, depending on their type, can flash between 0 and 120 times per second, while your overhead lights flicker at a rate of 50 or 60 times per second. The concept of frames is so fundamental in how displays and cameras work that the next obvious question is, what about the human eye? How many unique frames per second does it see? Zero. It sees zero. Or infinite, depending on the way that you look at it. Let's take a look at how the eye works. Inside the eye, there are five different kinds of nerve cells. Photoreceptor cells, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, retinal horizontal cells, and amacrine cells. Bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and amacrine cells are primarily responsible for the eye's reflexes, such as movement tracking, iris compensation, activating and deactivating rods and cones, and grouping signals for easier transmission. Photoreceptor cells are our rods and cones, cells that respond to either the intensity of light or the intensity of light at specific wavelengths. Our cones let us see color and detail in brightly illuminated environments and are concentrated in the fovea centralis, the dense region of cells directly opposite the lens in the eye that form the center of our vision. Rods are more sensitive than cones, but are indiscriminate to color and only see brightness. These are much more spread out across the retina and form the bulk of our peripheral vision. They also let us see at night and in poorly lit situations. Both cones and rods communicate with the other nerve cells through what's called a gradient potential. Changes in light striking the outer segment cause the cell to either absorb or release sodium or potassium, keeping the ion concentration at its synapse roughly identical to the amount of light hitting the cell. In other words, the cones and rods see the world continuously in what can be described as a low latency infinite frame rate. But this gradient isn't transmitted directly to the brain. Instead, it's carried by bipolar and amacrine cells to the retinal ganglion at the back of the eye, which form the optic nerve. The ganglion continually measure the gradient and transmit changes in the gradient to the brain through action potential, a quick spike in the charge of the nerve synapse. The rate of nerve firing communicates the information as a sort of pulse frequency modulation, with higher frequencies meaning that the gradient is getting stronger, and lower frequencies meaning that the gradient is getting weaker. The visual center of the brain processes these signals from the eye to create one unified perception of the world called the visual field. If your field of view, the stuff that's in front of you, isn't changing much, then your brain doesn't update the visual field, meaning that its frame rate is essentially zero. Collectively, the eyes and the vision center of the brain are grouped together into what's called the Human Visual System, or HVS. And since the parts don't work independently, what we should be looking at is the visual system as a whole, and not just the eye. So understanding the basics of how the HVS works lets us ask some better questions about frame rates. Question 1. How many unique frames do we need to present to the human eye in one second in order for the HVS to perceive continual, fluid motion? The answer to this question was discovered pretty quickly at the end of the 19th century with the advent of cinema. Both the Thomas Edison Corporation and the Lumiere brothers found that a frame rate of 16 frames per second was about the minimum that you could get away with to trick the brain into seeing continuous motion. Question 2. How many flashes of light per second are needed in order for the HVS to perceive the light as continuous? Once again, the answer comes from the early days of cinema and the same two pioneering companies. The Lumiere brothers noticed that at 16 frames per second, the flashing of the screen was unbearable. So they designed a double-bladed, and then later a triple-bladed shutter, in order to flash each frame more than once. 
At these higher flash patterns, the flash was almost unnoticeable. Similarly, Thomas Edison is said to have observed that 46 flashes per second is the minimum in order to keep the audience comfortable and to reduce strain. Later, his company was involved in research for the emerging alternating current electrical systems and determined that 48 flashes of a light per second was the absolute minimum in order for humans to see the light as continuous. Question 3. What's the shortest amount of time a flash of light needs to be in order to be perceived? The answer to this question comes to us straight from outer space. Yes, it came from outer space. Astronauts on the Apollo missions to the moon, who had left the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere, reported seeing spots, stars, streaks, and clouds of lights flashing once every about three minutes. While we're not sure the exact mechanism of interaction with the human visual system, we do know that the flashes were caused by high-energy cosmic rays, particles traveling at near the speed of light, which means that the actual flash durations lasted on the order of femtoseconds. That's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. But coming up with a fixed value is actually kind of impossible, since it depends on how much brighter the flash is than the ambient conditions. A brighter flash needs less time to be noticed. Question 4. What is the shortest amount of time a period of darkness has to be in order to be perceived? A 2009 study presented to the National Institute of Health looked at the degenerate effect of aging on the senses. To measure the degeneration of the vision, they measured the amount of time a dark gap had to be in order for each participant to be able to see it. Using a group of younger participants as a control, they found that the mean time for this group was only 18 milliseconds. For the older group, it was still only 22. This translates to a flicker-free flash rate of between 45 and 55 hertz. Some of the participants were still able to identify a blank period of only 2 milliseconds. That's a refresh rate equivalent of 500 hertz. But on the other hand, when we blink, we black out our field of view for a third of a second, between 300 and 400 milliseconds, and our brain just filters it out, unless you're focusing on the fact that you're blinking, like you're doing right now. Question 5. How long do we need to see a scene in order to be able to identify it? Now we're getting to the crux of what we really want to know. A 2014 study published in the journal Attention, Perception, and Psychophysics looked at the rapid recognition of images using a test that went something like this. In the following set of pictures, is there a boat? Did that group of pictures contain a wedding cake? No, there was no boat, and yes, there was a wedding cake. By asking questions both before and after the group of pictures, the researchers were able to control for both image recognition and image retention in the brain. They found that their subjects could identify images shown to them in as little as 13 milliseconds, or 75 hertz, with a statistical accuracy outside of simple chance. The researchers wanted to go further, but that was the limit of the hardware they were using. And that brings us to the last question of the bunch, probably the question that leads most of us to ask about the human visual system to begin with. Question 6. Are there any advantages to higher frame rates in cinema, television, video games, or virtual reality? I hope by now that you can see that the answer is yes especially in applications that benefit from a high level of detail, like video games, virtual reality, and sports broadcasting. But even traditional cinema can benefit from a higher frame rate, allowing for larger and brighter screens. When you enlarge motion to a larger screen, you run the risk of having motion separation, where the brain sees a double image because the jump between frames is too much, rather than continuous movement. This is less of a problem at higher frame rates. Additionally, the brightness of projected images in traditional cinema is limited in order to reduce our perception of flicker. But when developing the show scan format in the early 1980s, Douglas Trumbull found that higher frame rates 
especially 60 frames per second, removed this brightness limitation. And in the same set of experiments, Trumbull found that when all other factors were controlled for, the audience had a greater emotional connection with a scene at 72 frames per second than any other frame rate, which suggests that even though we don't consciously see them, we're still subtly aware of the period between frames, and removing them or minimizing them gives a much greater level of realism. On the other hand, 24 frames per second cinema does evoke a specific look of quality, a certain stylization that helps the viewer to suspend their disbelief, certain costumes, sets, and effects that hold up under 24 frames per second cinema don't look so good in higher frame rates. And yes, I'm looking at you, Peter Jackson's The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. But at the same time, it's not really fair to point out the problems of the first film done in this way. It does add a level of realism that it is my personal belief will benefit cinema in the end. But in order for it to get there, we have to look at the hurdles and overcome them rather than just saying it's too hard. So, all things considered, that's the frame rate of the human eye. If you were hoping for a simple answer, I really hate to disappoint you. I'm disappointed too. But the reality is, the real answer is far more interesting than a single number. For Tech Laboratories, I'm Tech Adams, saying keep thinking, and thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Tech Laboratories for more mind-blowing videos on science and technology. Here we go. The whole diagram is the complete engine nacelle made up of the Six airflow in the leap year, but a full solar year, which is the average time between two identical successive equinoxes, doesn't last. Photoreceptor cells are our rods and cones. Photoreceptor cells are our 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 photoreceptor cells are our light sensitive. That is like amazingly complicated to say. Photoreceptor cells are our rods and cones. Are our, are our. Photoreceptor cells are our rods and cones. Photoreceptor cells are our rods. <laughs> That's a tongue twister.